Hello guys! I am on time today. Well, two minutes late, but who's counting? And I had to pull out the ring light, which makes you look like ten times more attractive than you actually are. It's just the lighting. Um, because it's gloomy in Southern California all of a sudden. Like it literally, the clouds rolled in and it's about to, to rain. So the window light was not enough today. Um, and I did have a pre-submitted question, which was a little, not weird, it's, you know, no question's a bad question, but I just kind of want to clarify, uh, one of these girls said that, these girls, <laughs> one of you girls said, uh, I started taking a vitamin D supplement and it feels like it's getting flushed right through, uh, what could this be and how could I help it absorb better? So when it comes to vitamin D, it's not going to flush right through. It's not B vitamins. B vitamins are water soluble, meaning they come out in the urine. Vitamin D does not do that. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. Well, it's really not a vitamin. It's a hormone. And so taking vitamin D shouldn't like flush right through you unless there's something else in that vitamin D that's not working for you. What are the additives? That type of thing. But overall, um, vitamin D is kind of not always a great supplement to take for a lot of women. Unfortunately, it can really calcify your body if you're magnesium deficient. So if you don't take magnesium and you don't have a lot of magnesium intake, I always focus on magnesium first before ever even considering vitamin D. Okay, Amber, she writes her questions in her notes and she fires away and I like it. She keeps the live popping. So I'm gonna start with your question. What was the ingredient you said to look out for in traditional meds detox tea? I forgot. Oh, I think it's Senna. Um, I don't know if they have Senna in it or not. Senna is a laxative and it's a habit forming laxative. So you wanna watch out for that. You know what I mean? Hi, Cecilia. Hi, Rena. You always look amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you guys, it's really easy to look amazing when like only the top half of your body has to be on, on something and like your face. Um, it It is deceiving sometimes. Like most of the times I'm in sweats from the, from the bottom down. I always say like business up front, party in the back, you know? Is it possible to overdo vitamin E? Is it okay to take it every day? It is possible. It's a fat-soluble vitamin. Um, it is. It does have a blood thinning effect, so you do want to be careful. Um, but I personally take it every day. To say it's safe to take every day, I, you know, I'm not really allowed to say that. But for most people, it's okay to take every day. Still waking up with headaches daily. I think you mentioned something about protein before. Um, well, usually headaches are going to be blood sugar related, especially if they they have no cyclical nature, meaning that like some people are going to have hormonal headaches. They're going to happen in the luteal phase, maybe pre-period or during the menstrual period. So if that's the case, then it's like, okay, that's probably having to do with hormones. But if it's not cyclical and you're just waking up with a headache every single day, what's going on? Um, maybe it's the B vitamins. What B vitamins are you taking? Are you taking niacinamide in high amounts? That could be a headache. Take a break. Um, if you're taking a f more than three supplements, take a break from all of them until your headache goes away if, and see if it goes away. And if that's the case, then you know it's one of those supplements. So you want to tie it in one at a time to see what's going on there. Um, or it could be blood sugar related. So if there's not enough protein, um, it could be estrogen related. Um, so usually headaches are due to blo blood sugar dysregulation or um, estrogen. And uh, usually estrogen related headaches are cyclical, meaning that they'll come up at certain times of the cycle. So I would look more to blood sugar. And if you're waking up every day with, with blood sugar headaches, then that would be an indicator that maybe your blood sugar's dropping too low during the night. So maybe you need to wake up in the middle of the night and have a little snacky snack. Also magnesium bisglycinate, any issue with having too much? Having too much magnesium will usually just result in you having diarrhea. So I don't think there's too much. Sometimes you have to build up bowel tolerance or you will have like literally raging diarrhea. Um, but a lot of times people need more rather than less. So I usually do like five times body weight in ounces, plus maybe even transdermal or topical depending on, on what levels say. Got back my period after missing for a year. Woo! But now the frequency is every two months. What should I do to regulate further? I've got PCOS and insulin resistant. I'm also about 20 uh, kilograms overweight. Um, I think you should just keep doing what you're doing. Keep in mind that being overweight has nothing to do with um, 
I don't want to say it has nothing to do with your health, but just keep in mind that weight is a symptom of PCOS. It's not like a driving factor. And weight is always a symptom that the body is under stress and it feels safer storing fuel than burning fuel. We have to, when we're trying to lose weight, we always want to do it the right way, meaning that we're getting our body to a safe place where it feels like it can actually open up fat cells and burn what's in them. And sometimes that can take some time. It doesn't just happen all of a sudden. The body will store fat when it feels like it's not safe and getting it to feel safe can take a while. So the goal is to continue to keep blood sugar balanced, continue to make sure you have good sleep habits, get to bed at a decent hour, you know, 9 or 10 p.m., Make sure that you are um, exercising regularly, you know, getting a sweat in. When it comes to exercise, you guys always want to make sure you can nose breathe and you could, you're exercising not too hard to where you couldn't have a full conversation with somebody. So if you can't talk and you can't, you know, like if you couldn't have a conversation with someone, um, then you're working out too hard. So you always want to make sure you can nose breathe, you know, you're breathing through your nose, out through your mouth. That's a, that's a good way to regulate how hard you're exercising, but women with PCOS should be exercising, specifically strength training, and uh, getting enough sunlight. That's a huge one. So continually laying the foundation for your body, keeping blood sugar balanced, um, exercising, sunlight, sleep, lowering stress. And then if that's not enough, then you would maybe want to dig further. Is it a thyroid issue? Um, do you need to lower inflammation? Is that inflammation maybe stemming from the gut? Um, so you, you always want to dig deeper if the basics aren't working, but you always want to hit the basics first. I have a lingering ovarian cyst that won't go away and I've tried natural remedies for three months. My doctor keeps insisting I do birth control to get rid of it, but I don't want to put hormones in my body. What do you recommend and what causes them? Thank you. Ovarian cysts are usually caused by estrogen dominance or estrogen excess. A lot of women who have these issues, their doctor is going to just recommend shut the cycle down, right? Let's stop our production of estrogen, let's stop our progesterone, and let's um, replace them with synthetic hormones. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we can make our own progesterone. And a lot of times women with ovarian cysts have very high estrogen and very low progesterone. So the first step is, if your doctor is down, is to test your progesterone levels on day 19 to 21 of the cycle. Keep in mind, we ovulate mid-cycle, well most women do, and create progesterone. And then your progesterone is going to be at its highest around day 19 to 21 of the cycle. And so that's when you test it in order to see if you're making enough. You want it to be about 8 nanograms per deciliter or more. If it's really low or non-existent, then you know progesterone is really low and Estrogen is outshining that progesterone. That's not what we want. It can cause all types of issues, inflammation, blood uh, clotting issues, cramps, PMS symptoms, weight gain, but it can also cause ovarian cysts. So we first wanna make sure our hormones are balanced. Um, another thing that can be really helpful for ovarian cysts, and of course ask your doctor, is vitamin E. Um, good brands, so like Unique E or Mito Life's Pufa Protect. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're doing high quality vitamin E. Look into castor oil packs, that's another thing that can really, really help um, over the whole torso. And uh, overall supporting estrogen detoxification, eating a raw carrot every single day, making sure you're eating enough and keeping blood sugar balanced. Keep in mind that ovarian cysts are a lot of times driven by estrogen and inflammation, and so we need to get inflammation down. We need to make sure we're detoxifying our body well, and we need to make sure we're getting our progesterone levels up. Some women actually find a lot of success from doing bioidentical progesterone as well. So that's always an option to look into and do your own research on. Um, what do you think of marine collagen? Um, I'm not a huge fan because I'm not really sure where they're getting it from. Um, uh, and if it's like farm-raised fish, that's going to be a, a big problem. Um, going to have a lot of heavy metal accumulation. So I don't know. To be safe, I would just rather go for like a grass-fed collagen. But if you're vegan or vegetarian and you prefer doing a marine collagen, I guess that's a, a good option. So I guess it depends on the situation. Intense cramps, this ovulation, unusual for me, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it could be detox, it could be inflammation, um, it can be blood sugar imbalances, so I'm always looking for what can be driving these factors. Is my blood sugar balanced? Am I eating enough protein, carb, and fat? If that's a, a yes, and um, sometimes vitamin E can be really helpful for mid-cramp mid uh, or mid-cycle cramping. If you're doing detoxification, you're supporting detoxification, sometimes there's really nothing you can do if you're already doing everything. Um, so it's just kind of waiting it out. 
all my girls and fully nourished, it's, it's like an up and down situation, you know, when you actually start to increase your metabolism and you actually start to see your body um, shift and change, it's a lot of ups and downs. Healing is not linear. It's not one of those things where it's like, oh my gosh, I made all these changes and now I'm healed. Awesome. You know, it's like one of those things where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm having an amazing day. Everything's great. I'm glowing. And then all of a sudden you're like, wow, I'm like more bloated than I've ever been in my life. Or you're like, I'm having great periods. Awesome. 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 And then you're like, wow, I just saw a crime scene in my pants. So it's kind of one of those things where you want your good days to start to outshine bad days. And sometimes you're going to have cycles that are not so great. And then you're going to have cycles that are, are <laughs> really great and then not so great. And the goal is to eventually have more cycles that are super great and that infrequent, like not so great until they kind of just go off and you're, you never have a bad cycle again or very rarely. So check in with your stress levels. Um, do you know that you've been ovulating for sure the past couple months? Because sometimes women are like, I have a really painful ovulation all of a sudden. And I'm like, did you ovulate before that? Maybe this is the first ovulation you've had in a while. So, um, but yeah, I always do like if I have painful ovulation going on, lots of magnesium, vitamin E, B vitamins, um, making sure I'm supporting the liver, detox lemonade, castor oil pack, coffee enemas. Um, that's like pretty much my toolkit. I'm also maybe tying in a sweat here and there. I think women should mostly break a sweat every day unless they're really like exercise, they don't tolerate exercise very well at all. But most women should most likely be sweating every single day, whether it's a sauna, a detox bath, or um, exercise. So those are kind of the things that I always focus on. And uh, yeah, just kind of wave it out. Started taking DIM a month ago. I've taken it before, but stopped. My period's a week late and negative pregnancy tests. Could it be due to DIM stabilizing hormones? I personally hate DIM. Uh, DIM is super dangerous for a lot of women. It causes all types of symptoms. Not a fan unless you absolutely know that your phase one of estrogen detoxification is poor and needs support. Um, and the only way that you can really tell that is like doing by doing like a Dutch test that shows your actual estrogen metabolites. So I'm not a fan of DIM. Um, I think it can be a really big problem for a lot of women. It could also um, lower testosterone levels and a lot of women don't need to lower testosterone levels. Um, it can mess with estrogen levels, it can mess with progesterone, it can cause hair loss, it can make you feel crazy, um, and it could totally mess with hormones. So um, unless you absolutely knew you needed it, it could be actually like messing with your hormones. Any suggestions on getting rid of cystic acne? Yeah, I mean, cystic acne is one of those things where it's not just like a boom, boom, done um, issue. A lot of times it's being driven by inflammation and kind of poor detoxification. So, you know, I always sound like a broken record, but I'm always like, start with the diet, get nutrition down. So we want to make sure blood sugar is staying balanced, protein, carbon, and fat every like three to four hours. Sometimes women need two, but um, I try to like keep it as as infrequent as possible without like losing that frequency. Um, you know, for example, something like two eggs and a big cup of fruit or a smoothie that has collagen for protein, a handful of frozen fruit for carbohydrate, and maybe a scoop of coconut oil for fat. Um, maybe like a medium sized roasted sweet potato stuffed with some rotisserie chicken and maybe a little steamed broccoli on the side. You know, just looking at like we're really looking for balanced, wholesome meals. That's the first thing that's got to happen. Um, if that's happening and you're like still not seeing problems, check in with sunlight exposure. Are you getting enough sun? Are you sleeping well and are you getting to bed at a decent hour? Are you sweating every day? moving your body, getting lymph moving. What I mean by lymph is we have this kind of lymph fluid, which is interstitial fluid, that when we put stuff on our skin or we get exposed to stuff in the air, it soaks into our skin, right? Our heart is a pump for our bloodstream, but we don't have a pump for our lymphatic system. And so it's relying upon us moving our body and this fluid kind of moves. And then finally we'll dump into the bloodstream, dump into the digestive tract to be detoxified or carried out of the body. So we gotta make sure that we are moving to move toxins or we'll sometimes just have them stay stagnant. Especially if acne is sitting right here, you guys, this is right where those lymph nodes sit. And it's very common for women with PCOS and hormone imbalances to have acne that sits right here. And that's because detox is very poor, gut health is very poor. 
So we want to make sure we're having a bowel movement at least once per day. Um, if we're not, that's a first order of business, making sure we're working on our constipation issues. Um, sometimes intermittently, you know, we can use things like aloe vera or magnesium citrate, but long term, we got to look at this as a bigger issue. Why are we having sluggish bowels? Um, that means sluggish detoxification. If the waste isn't being taken out, there's a problem, right? And so, um, but with acne, I'm always looking at nutrition, sleep, sunlight, um, movement, stress levels, and then we're looking at, okay, what's going on? Why is there stagnation? Is there constipation going on? Has the liver been really burdened? A lot of women who have cystic acne have been on Accutane in the past, which can really mess with digestion. It's very harmful for the liver. It's, it's high dose synthetic vitamin A. Um, so, you know, if that's been a, a past use, then sometimes we got to look into like pancreatic enzymes, um, lots of liver support so it just kind of depends but a lot of times cystic acne is just driven by stagnation and lack of detoxification inflammation how do you know if you're copper toxic what causes this i supplement zinc because fish is gross that's why i ask um it's hard to like know for sure if you're copper toxic without getting a hair tissue mineral analysis balancing your minerals and then seeing you know a couple months later if your body starts pushing copper. There are like indicators of copper toxicity, things like high calcium, low magnesium, um, weird levels of zinc and so on and so forth, but you really only know that if you do a test, um, test of minerals. Um, but a lot of times copper toxic, copper toxicity is gonna be very similar to estrogen dominant symptoms because copper drives estrogen up and estrogen drives copper up. And it's similar with iron as well. So um, lots of PMS type symptoms. So, you know, heavy, clotty, crampy periods, mood swings, um, headaches premenstrually, um, uh, like vaginal aching, just PMS symptoms in general, and then lots of uh, mood and brain type symptoms, mental type symptoms. A lot of people report that copper toxicity makes them feel crazy. So anxiety, depression, fear, um, OCD, feeling like you're constantly um, like on alert all the time. A lot of people who are put on antidepressants are actually copper toxic and it's a big issue nowadays in a lot of women. Um, if you've ever been on the copper ID, if you ever drank long time exposure uh, to copper pipes. So just, you know, you've had some type of copper exposure that's long term or you have symptoms of copper toxicity because copper accumulates in the brain. A lot of times it's brain like symptoms. What are natural ways to help with endometriosis? Um, endometriosis is kind of a, a I don't want to say complicated condition, but it has a lot to do with dioxins. So dioxins are going to be poisons in our environment. So we've got to limit poisons. Um, filter our, our water. That's a first absolute must. Look into a Berkey with a fluoride filter or some type of like reverse osmosis like Purifex or Aquasana. We've got to filter our water because there's so many toxins in the water that are going to be a driving factor in endometriosis. That's like the first order of business, honestly. And then the second thing I'm going to look at is pesticide exposure. So trying to eat organic food as much as possible and balancing blood sugar all together to just keep stress on the body low. Those are like the two main things organic food, filtered water. Then the second thing I look into is gut health. What's going on with the gut? A lot of times there's a really bad bacterial imbalance and it's causing inflammation throughout the whole body. Lots of endotoxins, endometriosis, a lot of endotoxins stemming from the gut are going to cause inflammation throughout the whole body. And so dealing with gut issues head on, maybe taking a spore-based probiotic, eating a raw carrot salad every day, eating a raw apple every day, both of those have good fibers that bind to these endotoxins. And sometimes even taking activated charcoal can be helpful for that and then really looking at liver support so things like castor oil packs coffee enemas um, magnesium is essential some women do really good on things like uh, antibacterials so things like berberine or oregano so um, I, I would say like my main <laughs> I know it can get a little complicated but a lot of times there is very deep root causes to endometriosis but for the lack of making it you know not complicated is make sure you're filtering your water eating organic as much as possible balancing your blood sugar by eating protein carbon fat every three to four hours make sure you're getting plenty of sleep make sure you're exercising and sweating every day and making sure you're lowering stress and then if that does not help then looking deeper at what could maybe be a driving factor in those things. And then limiting dioxins. So stop drinking out of plastic. Stop using uh, non-organic tampons. Um, stop 
exposing yourself to so many environmental toxins as much as possible. Will your last two question highlights be saved? Um, I wasn't planning on doing it, but of course I can do it. I didn't know you guys like liked them so much. With my gut issues, which is improving little by little, sometimes when I drink water, it actually causes some pain and nausea in my stomach. Where my issues are at, waist, left side, weird? Um, not necessarily. This is where the pancreas lies. A lot of people with gut issues have pancreatic issues. Um, I would look into maybe doing a castor oil pack over the pancreas, do, do a little research on that. And I would just be careful, like, first of all, are you drinking filtered water? If that's not happening, then maybe that's a problem. Um, and if, if you are drinking filtered water, maybe you're drinking too much water in one sitting. Uh, maybe the water has to be warm. If the water is cold, that can sometimes really shock the digestive system and cool that digestive fire. Um, so drinking warm water is kind of helpful for a lot of people with gut issues. And then maybe thinking about doing more mineral rich waters. A lot of people who have really bad gut issues and are pretty sick, whether it's chronic illness or have PCOS or some type of mystery stress going on, a lot of them can't tolerate a lot of water, um, just plain water. Um, they need mineral rich foods like broth, coconut water, juices, things like that. And very little water is, is uh, tolerated. So that's just kind of something to keep in mind. But I would look at the temperature of the water. I would think about, you know, supporting the pancreas some more um, and think about maybe doing more mineral rich uh, hydration until further notice. I messaged yesterday, but you probably got so many. Is there a cure for gout? Um, yeah, uh, I don't want to say like a cure. That's kind of the wrong. I don't want to say like, yes, there's a cure for gout. But again, there's always a reason why things are going on. You just kind of have to get to the bottom of it. So um, if gout is really, really bad, I like to look at mineral levels. A lot of times gout is being driven by excessive amounts of calcium um, in, a, in a relationship to magnesium. And so it can be very, very painful. And cal calcium is like a very sharp mineral. And so when it's imbalanced, when it's really high, it causes sharp minerals type pain. Like you feel it, it's literally in your body. It's a mineral that's inside of your body. So getting to the root of mineral issues first and foremost is important. And then sometimes it's hormonal as well. Driven by hormones, it can be driven by gut infections, gut issues. So I, I treat every issue the same in the sense that I'm looking at a disease as a dis-ease of the body. You come to me with a diagnosis, cool. Like, great, you got a diagnosis, how did that help you? probably didn't help you at all, just put a name to what you have. Now, still, we have to figure out why it happened. So that's always a question we always have to ask ourselves is, why did this happen? Very rarely a diagnosis does that for us. We always have to look deeper. Why does the body get out of ease or diseased in the first place? Well, there's mineral issues, there's gut issues, you're not absorbing nutrients from your digestive tract, there's a lot of bacteria in the digestive tract that's stealing your nutrients and causing stress and toxin overload. You know, so we're looking at those things, we're looking at those individual internal stressors, and then we're slowly starting to take that stress off the body one by one. The body is a master healer. Once, once we give the body the environment and the tools it needs to heal, it does the healing itself. So it's hard to say, can gout be cured? I don't know. Um, in some people, it probably has been. In some people, probably not. It just really depends on the, where the body is at, at. There's unease in the body and how do you fix that unease? There's nothing to do with the gout and everything to do with what's going on deeper. And that's where you know functional lab testing really comes in handy. What's your take on Stephanie, the person? She's the 53-year-old keto lady that looks insanely good. Been keto 12 years now, carnivore, nose to tail, your opinion. I don't think she looks good. Um, women that are that lean usually don't have a cycle, usually don't have a period. And the thing is, is um, that kind of leanness for a woman is usually pretty unsafe. Uh, so I would really like to know if she truly has a period, is ovulating, what her progesterone levels are like, what her anxiety levels are like. But keep in mind, guys, she has very low stress, right? She lives alone. She doesn't have kids. She doesn't seem to like have a partner. Um, she kind of seems to be outside in the sunlight a lot. She eats mostly like very high quality foods. And so there are other factors that contribute to health besides our diet. And she has a lot of those things going for her. I really like her. I think like 
I mean, I like her in the sense of, like, she has a lot of good energy, but at the same time, like, a lot of what she says is just off base, and she's pretty, in my opinion, disordered, just, you know, she, she pretty much limits her <laughs> intake of everything, um, but I think, like, a modified diet like that, that added in fruit would even be better, the liver would work better, but yeah, I don't, Meaning like insanely good, what do you think is insanely good? For me, a woman that's fertile um, is insanely, looks insanely good. Um, and having that type of leanness, I know most likely uh, progesterone levels are, are fairly low. You mentioned eating carrot salad for some reason the other day. What was that for? Um, in my online program, Fully Nourished, I talk about Ray Pete's raw carrot salad. Um, the raw carrot salad is, has the specific purpose of binding to toxins in the gut and uh, lowering estrogen levels. So it's an easy way to kind of lower inflammation throughout the whole body and help with gut health. It does need to be done consistently, daily, or at least like semi-regularly um, to bind to those toxins, but it's simply just a shredded raw carrot, um, a little bit of coconut oil or MCT oil or olive oil. I prefer the coconut oil. Um, some white vinegar or apple cider vinegar if you want, and some sea salt. Just realize the organic meat I buy weekly is grain-fed, non-GMO, whatever. What do you think? I think it just kind of depends on... Uh, a lot of things. Um, sometimes we have to just do the best we can. If we have access to grass fed and it's almost the same cost, easy, easy decision. Um, but if you don't have access to grass fed, then there's your answer. Um, if you uh, can't afford the grass fed, say it's a couple dollars more, there's your answer. So it's really just weighing the pros and cons. A lot of us just say like, oh well, and we don't look a little further. I always say if you can get grass fed, it's a better option, um, but if it's too much to afford or it's unavailable, then just opt for whatever you can get. Is there any prenatal vitamin you recommend or is it enough to have Thrive B Complex, Magnesium, and Vitamin E? Um, I don't really recommend a prenatal because there's not a, really a lot that I like. Um, I do recommend checking out Lily Nichols. She has a really, like, she's all about prenatal nutrition and as much as I like don't agree with her low carb approach because that's a disaster for pregnancy um, I I think that she does a lot of research regarding like prenatal nutrition and, and even uh, pregnancy nutrition and uh, her uh, prenatal recommendations are pretty good like she's she's really looking for quality there my naturopath said vitamin E is great for fatty liver. Never heard that. Yeah, super great for fatty liver. It actually defats the cells of the liver, which is partially why I, um, you know, strongly encourage it and fully nourished is because a lot of us, if we've been on high fat diets, if we've eat a lot, eaten a lot of polyunsaturated fats in our life, our liver is going to have some type of, that we're going to have some type of fatty liver, which causes insulin resistance, right? We want our hepatic cells, our liver cells to be insulin sensitive. And when they turn to fat, they're not insulin sensitive. So we want to really make sure our liver cells are uptaking as much glucose as possible, which keeps our blood sugar balanced longer because the more glucose our liver can store, the longer we're able to go um, without eating and we want our blood sugar levels to stay stable utilizing uh, glucose that's been stored in the liver. So yeah, that's vitamin E is incredible for blocking PUFAs, which is why I like it and PUFAs are dry fatty liver. I'm so grateful for you and your info. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate you. Thank you for being appreciative. Um, I should also point out that with going off keto, upper, upping carbs, and using some supplements, I got my first period in 20 months about six weeks ago. Woohoo! Yay for starting to balance my body. Yes! When you get that period back, that is totally a sign as your body saying, hey, you're the real MVP, and we're moving in the right direction. I know it can be slow, but keep up the good work. That sounds, that's so amazing. Gina, I know you've been working so hard on all your stuff. A lot of days I wake up starving. Is that good or bad? That is good. Keep in mind, a healthy woman is healthy, hungry, happy, and horny. Keep in mind, four H's. Healthy, happy, hungry, horny. Those are all the things we want to be. And if we're hungry, our appetite is going. That shows that we need fuel in the tank. And that means we're utilizing fuel. Um, when your gas light comes on on your car, that's telling you, wow, you're using up gasoline very quickly. Obviously not, not as good as using up the fuel that you're eating. But 
it kind of gets the point across that when our gaslight turns on or our hunger signal turns on, our appetite is revved up, we are burning. And that's a good sign. What toothpaste do you like best in shampoos? Um, toothpaste wise, I kind of like go on different things. I, I've been using Dr. Bronner's lately and it seems to do the trick. Um, but I've used a lot of different ones like Desert Essence, uh, Dr. Bronner's. Um, sometimes if I run out or I just don't feel like buying it, I just use baking soda. I'll like dip my toothbrush in coconut oil and then dip it in baking soda. It doesn't give you that like minty fresh feeling, but it does the trick and it whitens up your teeth pretty good. So yeah, I've been using Dr. Bronner's. And then shampoos. I've been using a Cure Organics. I've really liked them. I keep going back and forth between them and Morocco Method. Morocco Method are like clay-based shampoos that are really detoxifying to the scalp, but the thing is, is once you switch over, you don't want to switch back because it takes like sometimes like three or four months to really detox the scalp and you go through this like super oily, disgusting phase. And I hate going through that phase. And I made the mistake of like going back to a more lathering shampoo once in a while and it like completely lost my, my scalp lost its ability to go a long time. So I love Morocco Method products, but I haven't been using them lately just because of the, the transition is so hard. So I've been using a Cure Organics. Been feeling a little constipated lately and BMs have been smoother than normal. Need more fiber. What are some good sources if I can't do raw fruit? Um, so cooked fruit's a really good option. Um, if you need some fiber, like doing some really well cooked greens sometimes works for some people. Um, some people do better with certain types of fibers and some people don't. So I always say like maybe try like well cooked greens thrown into a smoothie or something. So they're already kind of blended up and pre-digested. Um, maybe consider doing like some broccoli sprouts if you can do those. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, even a little bit of like really well steamed cruciferous vegetables can sometimes be healthy. So I would consider maybe trying a few different fibers as long as they're really, really well cooked and see how that goes for you. Mm -hmm. 36 day cycle and this time around, usually it's 30 days. Is this okay if here and there period is late by a few days? Um, it's not like, is it okay or is it not okay? You're always just kind of asking yourself, why is it late? usually means an ovulation is late, right? We never have a late period. We always have a late ovulation. Um, our periods don't come late, um, th but those ovulations do, and the follicular phase is what is usually lengthened. And so when you have a late period, you're always looking back to two weeks ago, because keep in mind, after we ovulate, our luteal phase usually is gonna last 11 to 14 days for a normal woman, unless we have a luteal phase deficiency, uh, which means usually like low progesterone. Our luteal phase isn't lasting as long as it should. So when we have a late period, we need to know when we ovulated. This is why tracking your cycle really comes in handy. It's really handy to know when you ovulated. So you can just say, oh, I ovulated six days late this month. I'm gonna get my period six days late this month. It's normal, right? But when we don't know when we ovulate, we're gonna be stumped as to, I don't know why my period's late, I have no idea. Well, if you knew when your ovulation occurred, you'd know why it was late. So um, if there's stress happening around the follicular phase or ovulation, then that's going to cause ovulation to be late. So um, follicular phase stress is the number one cause of a late ovulation, which is gonna therefore cause that late period. So I wouldn't say like, is it okay or is it not okay? It's more just, why is it happening? And if it's happening just because you were stressed around the follicular phase, awesome, now you know why. But if it's stumping you and you're like, I have no idea why it's late at all, there was no stress, nothing different this cycle, wasn't going on vacation, didn't do anything stressful, then at that point you sometimes ask yourself, especially if it becomes a pattern, what's going on? What could be maybe causing my periods to be uh, late or irregular? Should castor oil packs come before coffee enemas or the other way around if doing both in a day? Uh, I think they're a perfect match, so that's amazing, Melissa. And castor oil packs should always become or come before coffee enemas. The reason for this is that there is a strategy and you have to understand why. Castor oil packs dilate the bile ducts. So we have, this is our liver right here. And this is why we usually do a castor oil pack over our torso. I like to do it over the liver, the pancreas, and the small intestine just to like get the whole situation. Um, but the liver and the gallbladder is like right here. 
And so your bile ducts, which we know have a problem, are, um, are going to dilate and allow toxic sludge, because a lot of times our gallbladder, we're supposed to have really good free fl flowing bile, helps digest fats, it helps um, keep junk moving out of the liver very quickly. But a lot of times when our gallbladder's messed up, our gut's messed up, we just have digestive distress, our gallbladder gets kind of sludgy. The, the Think about it as like the oil in your car, it just gets kind of like sludgy and thick and it has a hard time flowing through. And so when we do a castor oil pack, we're dilating those bile ducts so that more can flow through. Coffee enemas stimulate bile to move out of the liver into the gallbladder, and then of course the gallbladder will move it into the small intestine. So if we have dilated bile ducts pre-coffee enema, we're gonna actually have more bile flow, more free-flowing bile come through that gallbladder. So castor oil packs first, coffee enemas after all the way. Sorry, that was like a long explanation for something pretty simple. Just found out I'm pregnant, woohoo! And my blood glucose has started being all over the place. Any suggestions to get them back to normal? First trimester, you guys, we need protein. We need to pretend like we're freaking bodybuilders, okay? So we are building another human being. What's the building blocks of your body and a baby's body? Amino acids, protein. And so a lot of women are eating like they always ate and it's not working for them in the first trimester. They get nauseous, they feel like uh, all over the place, blood glucose goes all over the place because protein is not raised. Gotta raise the protein. So I would aim for probably like around 150-ish grams if you're strength training or you work out, maybe even more. You're gonna have to play around with it until your blood glucose levels stay stable. But I would make sure I'm eating a, pr a protein and a carb at every meal and I would, I would, you know, my first trimester, I'm gonna make sure that I'm eating very frequently. Probably every two to three hours, eating a little something to keep that blood sugar stable because God forbid, gestational diabetes. It's like my worst fear. Um, so I'm always looking to balance blood sugar. But first trimester, keep in mind, it's like where your the fetus is rapidly growing. And so we've really got to make sure we're, we're eating for that. We're thinking of that. Like, okay, I have a rapidly growing fetus, even though it's tiny, it's mighty. And I've got to make sure that my body feels safe enough for this to occur. And so protein is going to be really helpful for blood sugar balance. Hi Jess, do you have a good diet for hemorrhoids and constipations? Ever since increasing dairy and meat, I have been getting more problems or a good solution. We have a squatty potty. Uh, thank you for your time with love, Reno, Nevada. Oh, I love that you live in Nevada. I'm not too far away, I'm in Southern California. Um, so when it comes to hemorrhoids and constipation, especially with the implementation of dairy and meat, are your hydrochloric acids low? I know that you were eating plant-based for a while, so maybe consider looking into hydrochloric acid and think about supplementing for a while just so digestion um, works better. You're digesting the protein from the meat um, and the dairy. Because a lot of times if we don't use it, we lose it. And so when we go long time without eating meat, long time without eating meat, sorry, we go a long time without eating meat, we, um, or sometimes have a hard time digesting it. So we just need to make sure we're digesting it first and foremost. And a lot of times hydrochloric acid uh, being low can cause constipation. So that's the first thing I would look into. Make sure you're doing a raw carrot salad every day. Maybe consider eating like a, a raw apple in the morning before you wake up, I'm sorry, excuse me, <laughs> um, before you wake, or before you start your day, just to kind of keep things moving. Um, but I would just make sure you're getting enough fiber for your body, easy to digest fibers, and maybe consider like increasing stomach acid, whether that's using apple cider vinegar, digestive bitters, or even supplementing hydrochloric acid with pepsin um, for a little while. A lot of people post vegan diet, uh, I will put them on hydrochloric acid with pepsin. I like integrative therapeutics or doctor's best because it, it has a higher dose. Um, or sometimes like uh, now's super enzymes are also a great option because they have a little ox bile, a little hydrochloric acid, digestive enzymes. So they have like a good digestive support. I'm focusing on estrogen detox, a waste of time if I'm on the pill, hoping to get off it so soon. No, it's not a waste at all. Nothing is ever a waste. Think of your health as like a bank account, right? Like every little thing that, every little thing, every little thing that we do is going to add to that bank account. And everything that we do that maybe is not so great for our health might take away from that bank account. And so when we can, little tiny habits build up to great amounts, right? It's like putting, you know, tiny amounts of money in a savings account. It adds up pretty quick. 
So no, it's not a, a waste to focus on detoxifying estrogen and to just focus on, on uh, overall body detox. It's actually an amazing thing to be doing. What should I do first after being told I have Hashimoto's? Will your guide help me with this? Um, it might help you with that in the sense of like, you know, laying a foundation for eating well, balancing blood sugar, making sure you're exercising properly, sleeping, that type of thing. Um, with Hashimoto's, we have to keep in mind that inflammation is usually high. Inflammation a lot of times stems from the gut and digestive. So I don't know where you're at in your health. A lot of times it's very hard for me because some people are already eating really healthy or eating paleo or doing everything quote unquote right. Right, and so they're looking like deeper like what's going on if you're starting from like a standard American diet then the first step would be okay let's change nutrition to be more gluten free um, more grain free you want to do um, you know proteins from high quality sources meats collagen and gelatin bone broth um, high quality dairy um, eggs things like that seafood shellfish um, and then you want to do carbohydrates from roots, fruits, and squashes, so whole food sources. And then fats from things like coconut oil and grass-fed butter and um, the, the high-quality dairy that we're eating. So keeping the diet fairly simple and high quality with minimal gut irritants, things like beans and grains and nuts and seeds are pretty gut irritating and are phytoestrogenic. And keep in mind that inflammation of the thyroid is driven by estrogen. Um, it's driven by uh, dioxins and pesticides. So environmental toxins, are you drinking out of a lot of plastic bottles? Are you exposed to a lot of environmental toxins? Did you just recently like redo your house and paint? Um, did you just buy new furniture that's off-gassing and smells like a chemical factory? You know, like kind of go through your mind and ask yourself, where am I being exposed to chemicals the most? How about my water? How about my makeup? How about my hygiene products? All of those chemicals go to that very delicate fatty fatty tissue um, that is the thyroid and so we first want to just eliminate stressors off the body that's the first step um, by having good nutrition balancing our blood sugar and removing chemicals as much as possible not you know stressing ourselves out about it and then if that doesn't help our symptoms then starting to dig deeper what's going on in the digestive tract run a GI map or consider um, you know, focusing on gut health with bone broth, collagen and gelatin, um, maybe doing some anti-inflammatory compounds like aloe vera or antibacterial compounds like oregano, and then supporting the liver with like B vitamins and things like that. But those are more in-depth things. The first step is always laying that foundation and making sure your nutrition is on point and making sure you've, you've eliminated toxins from your life. I've noticed on multiple occasions when I've eaten food, maybe not so body honoring, shoot me, that my pulses and temps have been amazing. What? Well, keep in mind guys that temps and pulses can drive up from what? Both good things like thyroid, um, thyroid and metabolic health and or stress, cortisol and adrenaline. So what is it? If you're seeing things shoot up really high, is it stress um, or is it um, high quality food and or not high quality food but is it actually your metabolism and then also you know ask yourself what you're eating is it necessarily like not body honoring because a lot of times we're like well it's actually slightly body honoring like is it high in sugar a lot of people need more sugar than they're eating um, so kind of like look at what are maybe the factors that are good in the meal that my body's responding to well because it's very possibly like you're having fun you're enjoying yourself you're just kind of laid back and that can really lower stress as well so I look at first is it stress that's driving those temps and pulses up or is it truly like good metabolic function that's first and foremost and then second of all um, what are you eating what is the thing that's maybe driving your temps up a lot of women start to find that when they eat like a, a free meal they are eating things that are naturally pretty high in sugar and have some saturated fat in it and that will absolutely drive temperatures and pulses up because it's pro-metabolic we're driving our metabolic function high making the body feel safe and fertile and cared for and it likes that if i have hashimoto's is it bad if i have vegan protein powder every day with blueberries and oat milk I hate oat milk a lot of times because it has canola oil in it, which is absolutely thyroid destroying. Um, canola oil is polyunsaturated fat. It's a highly processed oil that's very inflammatory. When we have Hashimoto's, I have Hashimoto's too, um, we're trying to lower inflammation as much as possible on the body. So I'm not a fan of oat milk for that reason. 
Um, and oats are very high in phytates. Um, so when we're eating them every day, they're binding to a lot of our nutrients. So I would opt for um, either coconut milk that has no additives or a high quality like goat's milk, sheep's milk, or even dairy's milk. Um, and then when it comes to vegan protein powder, what type of vegan protein powder? Is it brown rice protein that's very high in arsenic? heavy metal, it's gonna you know, harm the thyroid. Um, is it pea protein? It's very difficult to extract protein from peas, um, so that's a highly processed protein. So again, it's always relative. I'm not, you know, there's nothing like, it's not like foods are good or bad, it's more like, what is your goals and are you eating to support your goals? And if Hashimoto's is, you know, you're, you're trying to lower inflammation, I would opt for a, a lower inflammation milk and um, a, a higher quality protein like collagen, gelatin, um, or casein protein. Is folate or folic acid bad for you and why? Folate is amazing for you. We absolutely need folate. Folic acid is the synthetic form of folate. Keep in mind that folate is absor absorbed directly by bacteria in the digestive tract and that's how it's supposed to be absorbed. Um, folate is absorbed directly from our foods. Um, folic acid is synthetic, meaning it has to go to the liver and it utilizes specific enzymes that we don't have a lot of. So it can very, be very depleting on the liver. It's semi-toxic in the sense that our liver has to process it, the bacteria in the gut cannot absorb it. So I'm not a fan of folic acid, it can really deplete actually our good levels of folate and it can put a lot of stress on the liver, but folate is a great, um, is a great compound. Hi, I live in Michigan and won't see sun for at least seven months. I drink magnesium bicarbonate often. Would you suggest taking vitamin D? Um, I think when you live in a dark place, it's kind of one of those things where you want to get some light exposure as well as if you're going to supplement vitamin D. Um, doing high, high doses of vitamin D is not always a great idea, but low, like relatively low doses can be very therapeutic, um, especially when you have just no sun exposure. Um, I always recommend doing red light therapy um, when you live in a very cold, dark place um, and doing it pretty frequently, like maybe at least once a week, but maybe a couple times a week to actually get some uh, natural exposure to some type of light, even if it's not sunlight. And then maybe even consider switching out certain light bulbs for incandescent lights as they are very, they mimic that red light that comes from the sun, which can really, again, help the body lower stress and support hormone production. So incandescent lights, red light therapy semi-often, and maybe lower doses of vitamin D if that is something that you need. Any tips for blood pressure dropping when standing? Doctor confirmed it, but doesn't seem to think it's a big deal. Have Hashimoto's and bad anxiety. When going from sitting to standing, I mean free blood pressure. So whenever I see blood pressure levels go crazy and somebody has really bad anxiety, I'm always looking to adrenal function, stress, and that's going to be where your minerals at. Potassium, magnesium, sodium, and even calcium are all essential for proper blood pressure regulation. Keep in mind that the heart is that kind of pump that regulates the pressure of the blood, um, blood flow, and pumping heart or blood through your body. And the heart is a muscle. I keep going here, it's here. <laughs> um, the heart is a muscle, and so contraction happens with calcium. Calcium is the mineral that's responsible for contraction, and magnesium is the uh, mineral that's responsible for relaxation. And so we need both, right? Contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation. So when we have an imbalance of minerals, this can really cause cause issues. And then we have our adrenal glands, which have a high need for sodium and potassium. And when we have low sodium and low potassium, or low sodium and high potassium, or low potassium and high sodium, we're gonna see our adrenals pump out adrenaline and cortisol at wacko times, and it's going to cause an imbalance in blood pressure. So a lot of people that have blood pressure issues have a need for magnesium, potassium, but it's hard to say without getting a test. I recommend a fairly inexpensive test called the Hair Tissue Mineral Analysis, HTMA. You can get one for 50 bucks, and it is an amazing way to see where your mineral levels are at, and I highly recommend it to people that are dealing with weird mystery issues. Keep in mind, minerals are kind of like those spark plugs of the body, and so we really want to know what's going on with all of these little tiny enzymatic reactions that are happening throughout our cells, throughout our body, and the minerals can really regulate how these things occur. 
So when we're having hormonal issues or we're having anxiety or we're having blood pressure dropping, we want to always say, why is this happening? And a lot of times the foundation is, of course, good health, good nutrition, but sometimes minerals have been imbalanced or depleted for so long because we've been in a stress state or we've gone through a traumatic event or something like that, and we need to actually supplement certain things to get our, our levels back up to normal. If you have to choose between cage-free and organic eggs, what would you choose? I would choose organic for sure, um, cage-free. So when you're looking at labels, you guys, and I know it can be really confusing, but you just kind of have to like get in your get in the mind of the marketer. They're trying to stop as many labels as possible in there, even if they're meaningless. And so cage-free just means it has not cage-free doesn't tell you anything about what they're fed, right? Just tells you what their environment is like. Cage-free eggs usually are required to have an open barn door so that they can roam around, um, but it has nothing to do with the food that they're eating, so they can still eat crap food. Um, organic, at least, is regulated to, in the sense of they can still, they have to be fed organic feed. So even if it's organic corn or organic soy, which is not optimal, at least it's organic and not genetically modified, which is a big problem for a lot of people. Will you uh, be your children? I'm sorry, I can't say the word. Um, I, um, no, <laughs> um, I, I will try uh, my best to not, but I live in California right now, so that needs to change because I, I gotta get out of California if I'm going uh, to do that. Um, I have a very hard time sweating. I have to work out hard, but it has to be upwards of 90s outside to be able to sweat some help. Um, a lot of times this has to do with the body's trying to not lose minerals, right? And so um, when you're trying to not lose minerals, um, your body's going to try to not lose things like water um, or sweat. And so a lot of times it, it points to like a thyroid issue or maybe the body's under extra stress. Um, things like sodium and potassium and magnesium and calcium really do help with sweating. Um, but a lot of times it just shows that the body is stressed out and is trying to retain as many minerals as possible. Uh, specifically, a lot of times sodium and potassium. Is the Brita a good enough filter? What do you recommend? Um, the Brita is not. Uh, it just filters for taste. It doesn't filter like dioxins, pesticides, anything like that. And so unfortunately, uh, it's not a good enough filter if you're looking to actually get fluoride and chlorine, which are those uh, anti-thyroid things put in the water, or you're trying to get, you know, uh, the antidepressants and the pesticides and, and heavy metals out of your water. Um, if you want a pitcher type, uh, a pitcher type filter, uh, the Aqua Gear pitcher tends to be a pretty good option. It's not the perfect, it's not the best, but it, it works well. It's, pr it's pricey for a pitcher, but when you're looking at a filter, it's going to be an investment. Um, so the Aqua Gear for a pitcher um, or a Berkey with a fluoride filter is a good option or like the Pure Effects filter or uh, Aqua Sauna, which is a, like a reverse osmosis type under the counter filter. Also, winter is coming here and I will not have the option to grab some sun. Have you done a story about your red light? Would that help with vitamin D for the winter? Need to know how to make me one. Um, when it comes to vitamin D, the only uh, artificial light that can help you make vitamin D is UVB lights. So that, of course, is a controversial topic. Some people are like, oh my god, sunbeds cause cancer. And I'm like, literally, there's not one thing that shows that sunbeds cause cancer. Um, it was just about taxes. Keep in mind, they put a sin tax on tanning, so they could just charge you money because it's now a sin, it's similar to cigarettes and things like that. But there's actually not one thing that shows that sunbeds cause cancer. Um, in fact, there's more studies that show self-tanner causes cancer, which is very interesting, that active ingredient uh, DHT, so or DHA, excuse me. Um, so um, UVB beds are the only thing that, that uh, is going to give you vitamin D levels. I'll let you do whatever you want with that information. Um, it's not that I'm like pro tanning beds. It's not that I'm anti tanning bed. I think it's very personal to the situation. Um, and I always, if I was going to do a UVB bed and I lived in a very like dark place, I would most likely do something at a very low level um, for a very short period of time, like the sh shortest increments I could. Um, or there's always 
is lizard light. So lizard or um, reptile lights are also technically UVB lights and they do help you produce vitamin D. Um, but red light therapy still does give you a lot of benefits that sunlight's going to give you. Those hormonal benefits, those anti-inflammatory benefits, those really good mitochondrial benefits. That doesn't mean it's going to help you produce vitamin D, but it still gives you, there's other things that are uh, therapeutic from sunlight besides vitamin D production. And so red light therapy is very helpful. It doesn't help us produce vitamin D though. So that would only be, the only artificial way to do that is with UVB beds or UVB lights and, um, uh, or vitamin D supplementation. Pins and needles in feet and sore when laying down. Any thoughts? Magnesium all the way. A lot of women who have like restless leg syndrome, pins and needles, things like that, um, when they apply like a magnesium oil or a magnesium lotion, it really takes care of a lot of those, uh, the, the pain. Can low potassium affect progesterone levels? Yes, because it affects blood sugar. It, it affects the way glucose enters the cell. Potassium has as big of a role on blood sugar regulation as insulin does. And so it's it has a very big role in allowing glucose into the cell, which is energy, right? And you know, your ovaries are made of cells, your brain is made of cells, everything is made of cells, including the uh, glands that make your hormones. So absolutely, it can have a, a huge effect on hormone function. Minerals absolutely affect the hormones. What's your advice for someone who has tracked macros through MyFitnessPal for over a year and wanting to quit because it becomes an obsession? Um, I would say that you need to sit back and ask yourself, like, do I trust myself around food? And I know this is more of a mental thing, and sometimes it, it does require therapy. It, 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 you have to decide if it's actually become an eating disorder. Um, just because it's not clearly bulimia or anorexia or um, orthorexia, is it an eating disorder? Are you disordered around food without your MyFitnessPal or your phone? And I know that's kind of a hard thing. Like it's, it's not an easy thing to face, and sometimes we're not ready, but we do have to sit with ourselves and say, is this a problem that I need help with? I need someone to walk me through. And if that's the case, then seek help. Um, if you feel like it's not quite there yet and you are wanting to take it on your own and you're like, I just kind of need to, to clean break it, clean break it. Um, you know, delete the app. Like, cold turkey that bitch, you know? Like, get that thing out of your vicinity. Um, delete your account and uh, rip the bandaid off, you know? If, if weighing has become an obsession, put the scale high up in the closet away from you, you know? So kind of cold turkey it um, and trust yourself around food. Like ask yourself, do I trust myself around food? Like if you have been tracking my fitness pal, you know what a, a certain amount of protein is, calorie or macronutrient rise. You know what a certain amount of carbohydrate is, you know, calorie and macronutrient rise. Like you've been tracking so long. I hope that you've absorbed that information and, and been empowered around your food. Um, now you know exactly what food is composed of protein, fat, and carb. That's an empowering thing. A lot of women don't know what is a protein, what is a carb, and what is a fat. That's basic stuff, but a lot of people don't know that. And so look at it that way. Like, I'm grateful, I'm empowered by it, and now, you know, I'm flying from the nest. I can now kind of like, you know, I guess know what vicinity I am in macro-wise. I know uh, around how much protein I'm eating, and I know around how much carbs I'm eating, and I know how around how much fats I'm eating. So um, I think you kind of need to like sit back and, and ask yourself if it's a, if it's a problem and then um, go from there. Like what's going to be the best route for you? And you know yourself best. You know what I mean? Like you know what you need to do already. You're just asking me, but you know. My mom is going through menopause and has bad hot flashes. She also does CrossFit. Could that be making her symptoms worse? She eats pretty well and balanced. Hmm. Um... I, yeah, it could definitely be making her worse because cortisol uh, can also cause hot flashes. Um, and keep in mind that stress on the body, including like stressful exercise, is totally going to cause an increase in cortisol. And that can absolutely be a problem. So, yeah, it could, abs it could be making menopause worse. If we have low stomach acid, should we be supplementing hydrochloric acid before collagen, grass-fed liver capsules? Um, no, I think that would probably give you really bad heartburn. Um, but you know, if you feel like you're really not digesting those foods well, then maybe, but I probably wouldn't. I only do it with really protein rich meals. Um, or I get like bad heartburn, not the leanness for her. I was admiring her skin, happiness, energy, drive at that age. Yeah, totally. Um, 
Thoughts on Chastry or Vitex to treat PMS? It can be helpful. Um, you always want to know your luteinizing hormone levels before you do Vitex because if they're high, uh, Vitex does drive luteinizing hormone up and that can cause like more issues. What are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? My doctor is recommending I do this because of insulin resistance. I hate intermittent fasting. Um, I don't think it's a great idea for women at all. Um, and I see a lot of doctors now recommending it, which is like, you know, I guess I can't, I can't really tell you to go against the advice of your doctor. I just can, you know, remind you to just use common sense. Um, what do you think about white rice carbs? Um, white rice is a starch, so um, it can be helpful for some people. Sometimes it just drives blood sugar right up. So it just kind of depends on the person. But uh, white rice tends to be a pretty anti-inflammatory and a good carbohydrate if you uh, don't have really bad blood sugar regulation issues. Thank you so much for your answers. It's 9.35 in Nova Scotia, and I've been up since 3.40 for an appointment, so off to bed. Aw, have a good sleep, Gina. Tips for a period after three months of doing FN. Hoping this one will be different. Do you not like Sam E for estrogen detox? Um, I would look into Vitex if it's something that is applies to you. Sometimes that can be really helpful. Um, I am not a fan of Sam E, but I am a fan of vitamin E for estrogen detox. But again, it's, it's very relative on the person. If you feel like Sam E is the, is the right thing for you, then absolutely go for it. Um, okay, guys, I'm sorry Instagram's cutting me off. It's been an hour. This is going to be live for the next 24 hours. If you guys didn't get your question, I'm going to allow pre-submission for Friday's live. So I will be going live again at 9 o'clock on Friday morning, and uh, you guys can submit your questions again, uh, then. Thank you so much for joining me.